Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. This is episode 72 of the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Hey, make sure you stay tuned. Here in just a couple of minutes, we're going to have an incredible chat with the amazingly talented Scott Moon. So much good stuff. You're going to love it, love it, love it. I guarantee we're just a few minutes away from that interview, so hang on just a moment. Meanwhile, I want to wish everybody a happy Father's Day. All you dads out there, hopefully you had a really nice weekend like I did. Didn't go anywhere, didn't really do a whole lot per se. Uh, Mostly just uh, spent my weekend with family. Um, I actually stayed away from the studio and from doing some writing this weekend. I was planning on doing some writing, but had a lot of things came up. Overall, it was just a really nice weekend, uh, making a point to spend time together as a family, which has been especially meaningful for us here in my family. Um, not, Not to get down too much. We, we do have a, uh, a very close family friend, um, someone who's very special to all of us here. And, uh, you know, they've been, they've been dealing with cancer for quite a while now. And uh, there for a while, everything was looking really, really good. But we got some news recently that is not so good. Um, actually, pretty bad. But, uh, you know, it's not the end. We'll see what happens. But it's, it's definitely hit us hard. And, uh, you know, if anybody out there that is, is a believer in praying for my friend, um, you know, we'd appreciate that. But anyway, this all goes to say that, yeah, spending time with family has been very special. Um, and, uh, we, we just made the most of, uh, time together this weekend, you know, so we can make memories, um, for all the books we're going to write or that we're trying to write for all the shows I'm trying to do. The things that we do like this, that's one thing, but making memories, you know, spending some time fishing, spending some time just hanging out and talking, those are some special memories that you can't put a dollar amount on. And I I hope all of you dads out there got to have at least a few moments like that with your kids this weekend. And uh, anyway, so I'm sorry, I hope I didn't uh, bring us down too much, but uh, let's bring things up a little bit. I want to make sure and invite everybody to go back and check out the backlist. It's been a very popular thing here of late. Uh, oh my gosh, I've really enjoyed watching the numbers for the backlist grow. Uh, people just love going back and checking out the uh, the past authors that we've had on here and listening to their stories. And so I invite you to uh, to do the same. Go back, find an episode that you like, and when you find one that you like, go ahead and share that with your friends and tell them about. Hey, there's this show where the, these authors that uh, we know and love are reading from their books. So check it out. I also want to invite you to make sure you like us on Facebook and Twitter. We try and post as much as we can, and I'm going to try and get a little bit better. I've learned how to uh, download a thing where I can do more posts. And I uh, just need to spend a few minutes you know, each week to load up some more posts in there. Uh, so I'm going to try that out. And uh, that way I can share more information, share more stuff with everybody that's following us. Uh, we are also in on YouTube, as I've said before. So that's a really cool thing where you can very, very easily go in and see the book cover while the whole episode is playing in the background. So I invite you to check that out as well and subscribe to the channel so that way you don't miss out on any episodes going forward. I also want to invite you to check out our sponsors. Uh, our first one is, that's been with us the whole time that the show has been around uh, is a little bit of a regional one. So if you are in Missouri, you're in the Warrensburg area, and you're looking for self-storage, look no further than you store all. They have two facilities, both of which are completely fenced in with gated access. There's climate control and non-climate control. They, they run almost everything off of solar power, so it's a very green company. LED lighting, uh, you know, the, their uh, thumbprint on the local area's grid, I guess you'd say that. I don't know if I'm saying that right or not, but their, their uh, green thumbprint is a big one, whereas their carbon imprint is not good. And I, I think I'm saying that right. I'm going to have to ask them again, maybe write that down next time. But <laughs> the point is, 
<laughs> Point is, they are a very green company, and I thought that was a really cool thing. I wanted to make sure and mention. Uh, not only that, but between the two facilities, they have more than 60 cameras recording 24 hours a day. Motion cameras, infrared, you name it. They're watching over it. Check them out online at ustoral.net. That's spelled the letter U S T O R A L L dot net. I also invite you to check out our big sponsor, Scrivener Writing Software. They are so incredible, and I have loved having them on board with us. It's been a blast getting to talk to people and uh, finding out how they like to use Scrivener. I talk, talk to them about how I use Scrivener. It is the number one writing software out there. So many applications for it, so many ways to use it, and you're going to actually hear more. Uh, you're going to hear some tips today from our guest, Scott Moon, who uses Scrivener, and it, he does it in a way that I'd never thought about before. So make sure you uh, listen to the ad coming up here in just a minute for Scrivener, and uh, don't forget to check out that coupon code CHAPTER. So if you decide you want to go and purchase one, use that to save yourself 20%. And last but not least, I also want to say thank you so much to my friends over at PopGoesTheCulture.com. They are a complete podcast network with, uh, I think there's 15, 12 to 15 shows on there. Lots of wonderful, wonderful shows. Some of them uh, air a couple times a week. They have multiple episodes. Other ones are once a week. Uh, just too many to mention. So much good stuff. You can go on there, check out the podcast. You can read articles about pop culture and dad geek culture and all kinds of really, really neat stuff. So make sure you head on over to popgoestheculture.com or click the link in the show notes. It's a lot of fun. This week, I had a fascinating chat with the incredible Scott Moon. He's a sci-fi, urban fantasy, and I would say even military sci-fi writer. I, he and I have been trying to connect for many, many months. I mean, it, it goes back to last year. But I know he's a very busy man, and, and you know my schedule can be a little bit aloof sometimes. So uh, I was just so thrilled to finally get a chance to talk to him. And we had a, we had a wonderful chat on, on air and off air. Uh, so many, many good things. You know, but uh, you know, not only that, but Scott is incredibly prolific. So in addition to his own numerous books, he's also collaborated with some of the some of the biggest names in sci-fi today. Richard Fox, J.N. Cheney, Nick Cole, Jason Ans Ansbach, I believe that's how you say it, and a previous guest, Craig Martell. It's just so many great things. Uh, we're going to talk to Scott and uh, hear about how he balances work and writing. Uh, his process for writing with dictation, which includes some wonderful tips on Scrivener. So many good things. Stay tuned. We're going to get over to that interview right after a word from our sponsor. Jason here. Hey, I wanted to take a moment and tell you about my favorite writing tool, Scrivener. Now, I know you've heard about Scrivener because their writing software has been embraced by hundreds of thousands of other writers like you and I, from the novice to best-selling novelists. The reason we all use it is because of Scrivener's core concept to bring all the writing tools you use together in a single application. And with tools like automatic backup, character maps, project goals, and let's not forget that amazing cork board, you can see why I use Scrivener every day. As a bonus for Sample Chapter Podcast listeners, use code CHAPTER for 20% off your desktop version. Scrivener Writing Software, built by writers for writers. Hello, Sample Chapter fans. Welcome to another episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. This week, we are having a sit down with sci-fi urban fantasy author, none other than Scott Moon. I'm so excited. I've been working on this for, oh my gosh, it's been several months, hasn't it? Oh yeah, I, I appreciate your patience. It's taken us a while to get to get linked up on the same schedule. So, oh, man, I, I've been just as tough as as what you have been. So, I mean, and I know it's it's been a it's been a while, but I'm I'm really excited to have you here. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, going over your collection of books, it, it just blows my mind. I mean. 36 books uh, between you and your collaborations, and then you got anthologies. I, I mean, apparently you just you don't work at all, right? 
And yeah, well, kind of the opposite, but I, I do, I am kind of uh, committed to it. I really love writing and I use my spare time. I've become a master at squeezing some writing or voice dictating into, you know, places you wouldn't normally think would be good writing, you know, but mm -hmm. it all works out. Get it done. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, uh, you know, and I, that was something I was going to ask was how do you manage with because I, I know you are a very busy guy uh, with, with uh, your your police officer there in Wichita, right? Yep, sure am. About tw almost twenty three years now. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you're safe and and you're doing well. And I that's a job that I really look up to. So I really thank you for for what you do. I appreciate that. And we, you know, the, the thing is, is if you go on social media, there's a lot of, you just, you think everybody hates cops. But when I go out into the world, unless I'm on a call, almost everybody, you know, I get a lot of people and kids come up and they're like, hey, thank you for what you do. And it's really appreciated. You know, it makes it a lot easier to stomach knowing that most people get it, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's good. So how do you find that balance in? It sounds like you do a lot of dictation. Yeah, I do some voice dictation. Um, I started doing voice dictation several years ago just as a way to kind of challenge my imagination or to think differently and hoping it would give me a different color to the creativity. Mm -hmm. um, but I use it a lot now for also not so much for raw speed because you can voice dictate really, really fast, but that there's a balance between how fast you voice dictate and how much cleanup it takes and those things. But I, I use it. So basically what I do is, and I'm changing a little bit now, I've backed off. I was, I have to be at work at 6.30. I work a 10 and a half hour day, four days a week. Um, and for a while I was working part-time jobs on my days off, but I quit all those. I, I started doing well enough with the writing. I was able to let the, the extra jobs go. But generally I would get up at 3 a.m. I'd be hardcore writing by 3.30. I'd write for an hour or two, depending on, on how close I wanted to cut it to get into work. And then I'd go to work. And if I got like lunch break, if, if maybe the family was busy in the evening, um, or if, the, you know, or if I really had a deadline, they'd, you know, know that I needed to go downstairs and work for a little bit. And then on my days off, I would just, uh, hammer it all day long, you know, especially if the kids are in school, and my wife's at work, you know, I might put in a super long day. And just break it up. You know, you work for half an hour, an hour, get up, stretch, do something, come back, do it again, and just keep going. And and uh, as long as you can stand it. So mm -hmm. it works good. And I, I'll make like an outline. I'll throw it into Dragon Dictation on my phone. And so I can, if I get a moment where I'm like stalled out, like waiting in, in line, like at the McDonald's, you know, I'm waiting, waiting in a long line at a drive through I'll pull out my phone and dictate, you know, a couple hundred words. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, it's kind of neurotic, but you do what you got to do. And the, the end goal is that I eventually will be writing full time and I can kind of live a little bit different lifestyle where I can enjoy the writing, but also chill a little bit. That That's really inspiring, though. I mean, because it's for me, it was I, I've uh, I, I'm huge on Scrivener and I've got it on my desktop. I've got it on my laptop and then I've got the app. So that way I can be shopping with my wife at uh coals or something and i'm like yeah i'm gonna go over here where the couch is i'm gonna sit down on the couch while you shop and i'll hop on scrivener and, and keep going for a while on my current project and yep. that's that's been great but uh yeah you know i might have to try some dictation that sounds well you know and i, and I love scrivener I, i'm looking at it right now uh and i use it sometimes i'll just do voice dictation straight into the scrivener with the voice recognition just innate to the phone oh. and it, you can do that you just got to kind of watch um, you know, it's like I said, it's always a matter of cleanup, but also when I, I'll drop, I, since I have the, the iOS Scrivener app on my phone, which you probably do, mm -hmm. um, and then I, I'll, I can just cut and paste and just drop it into Scrivener and, um, clean it up, uh, as, as we go. So I, I kind of go back and forth as to which, which I do more of, but I, and I'll thumb type, you know, I wrote, um, one of my urban fantasy books is, is Dragon Badge. And I wrote it a while ago. And at the time, I was working as a security guard um, in the security off-duty position at a Walmart. And I had to stand up front for like nine hours at a time. And I would pull out a PDA, uh -huh. four cell phones, and I would sit there and just, just my stylus, just tap out words. And I wrote probably 30% 30, 30 of that book on just tapping out letter by letter with a stylus. So, oh, my gosh. I remember those. 
it was, yeah, it was tedious and it didn't back up very well. And sometimes I'd lose data or copy over the wrong thing because I'm not very techy. And, um, yeah, but you know, it was better than chiseling away at a stone tablet or something. You know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. I, I always got in trouble in high school back in the eighties in uh, typing class because I was never doing the lessons. I was always trying to type out a story. Exactly. Yeah. I used to get in trouble for reading in math class. I'd have to, yeah. <laughs> Reading a science fiction book or fantasy novel or something. Yeah. So with all these books, how how long have you been writing? Like when did you get started? I, I st- so I'm almost fifty, and I started seriously wanting to be a, a writer, like as my profession, when I was twelve years old. Um, it started out uh, I'd been writing st- stories, and and my mom knew I liked to write. She'd read my stories because your moms love everything you do, obviously, which is good. Mm-hmm. And uh, and playing a lot of Dungeons and Dragons around that time. And she said we should write a book for kids my age. So we started doing that. And ever since then, I've always dreamed about, you know, making it as a writer. So it's, it's been a while and you know, I've done different things. I had, had some forays into music where I thought I was going to be a rock star. And <laughs> I went to college, um, you know, became a police officer and all of those things. I was always hoping that I would get something for them from them. That could go into be writing. You know, like as a police officer, there's lots of situations you come into. It's a great place to study characters and meet people, um, and you know, and get a lot of a lot of input for your subconscious to go into stories and 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 those types of things. So I've always just kind of done it on the side. Sometimes I've been more aggressive than others. Like the last probably ten years have been really aggressive. But when I was in the in '97, I was in the police academy, and I used to get up. I got up pretty early because I think I had to be there at 8, and I think I got up around 5.30 or 6 or something. I'd write for an hour or two every day, which I thought was a lot at the time. <laughs> you know, That's back in the days when if somebody wrote more than one book a year, you thought they were amazing. But nowadays, you got to write like 15 books a year to, to show off. <laughs> right. Well, and it, so it sounds like that's giving you, a, like you kind of get what you said there, a wealth of background and um, world building almost or characters to go with because i like i've read assignment dark landing and uh it was fantastic i loved the characters and even though you didn't have a lot of details per se i still felt like i was on that planet and i understood the characters so yeah. you, you had a real great characterization of everybody I, I love those characters i, I especially love the pig dog and <laughs> yes the pig pig dog's a big favorite so. Yeah, well, and it, it definitely had that uh, that Firefly feel for it. So uh, Craig was telling me about that. I was like, all right, well, I got to check that out. I'm, I'm hoping we're going to get that. Um, we're giving that another big push because I, I get a lot of people. That's the one series. If I meet somebody like at a conference, like at 20 Books, that's the one people will come and ask me about. When are, you gonna, when are we going to see the next Dark Landing? And, you know, it did, it did well because anything Craig touches does pretty well. But it, it hasn't... Um, it hasn't found its larger market yet. We haven't found all, I don't think all the people that would like dark landing have found dark landing. Mm-hmm. And so we're trying to do that. And if we can kind of, uh, you know, because nowadays it's be, be straightforward. If you want to write for a living, you can only write stuff that is going to sell. And if, if we can't find the audience for it, then, you know, we're probably not going to go ahead on it, but we're, we're doing some things this summer and I'm kind of hoping to do season two. Oh. It's, that's because those characters are really, I really like those characters. They're, they're just a lot of fun. I feel like, I feel like they're real people. Yeah. In pig dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it, well, the, your, your main character's obsession with just the office chair was, I, oh, yeah. I knew, I knew how that felt right away. <laughs> so. Yeah. Craig started that, that story, storyline. And cause we kind of kicked the stories, the episodes back and forth. Um, and uh, he got that got that rolling. So I think I think if we do a second season, they're gonna because the first season of Dark Landing is all on the planet Unguluk. Mm-hmm. But uh, if we go forward with season two, they're gonna the, some of the main central characters are gonna get on a ship and they're gonna go out and about. It'd be more like Firefly, like for real, you yeah. know, going on those types of adventures. Could be fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, what when you're looking for something to read? Uh, whether it's sci-fi or whatever else, what what are you looking for? What I like to read is I like um, I like characters 
that are put in really difficult situations. And I kind of don't like that. Like in real life, it's very stressful, but I like to, you know, when you got those characters that make the impossible decisions, like I love, you know, I, I like Brandon Sanderson style fantasy and Robert Jordan, but I also like, George R. R. Martin, Game of Thrones stuff, and that's probably more my favorite. Mm-hmm. And part of it is because if you look at the situations those characters are put in, they're just impossible. There's really the best of two bad decisions they have to make every time, you know, or you have the impossible, irreconcilable goods that they have to choose between, or, you know, it's like kill your sister or your father or something, you know, that's, I can't remember the exact example of that, but it's always like that. And, that makes it more interesting than should I go right or left or should I chase the bad guy? Of course I'm going to chase the bad guy like in a TV show, but should you chase the bad guy if the bad guy was also your brother? Oh, wow. And where, where does your loyalty lie? And those things make more tension and suspense for me. So that's why I like. I like good characters. I like suspense. I like really vivid worlds because I, you know, I like to read to go. I read very slowly because I will daydream around in the book. I'll, I'll find that I'll be holding this book in front of me and I'll realize I haven't moved on from this page for a while because that scene caught me and I'm, I've implanted myself into the story and I'm off running around chasing the dragon myself or something. I'm, I, so, I, I'm so happy I, to hear you say that because I do the same thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, for a long time I was like, man, I really hope this isn't weird because that's what I do. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. No, that's, I, I always worry because I hear about my friends who are like, oh yeah, I read this book today. Or, you know, yeah, I'm on my fifth book this week, and I'm going, yeah, I'm still reading the same one. Yeah, I'm so slow. And I love audiobooks um, because it gives me that extra reading time. Mm-hmm. But audiobooks, there's only so fast you can read them. Yeah. And uh, and so they take some time to get through as well. But I always got, I always have usually an ebook and an audiobook, and then usually some sort of nonfiction that's sometimes in paper. I got, you know, I always have about three going at once. <laughs> wow. Well, I was going back through here through your books and taking a look at everything. I mean, Chronicles of Ken Rowland, Dark Landing, Fall of Promisedale, Grendel, Uprising. I mean, it goes on and on and on. And I'm seeing about a book a month uh, this year alone. Uh, are you going to keep up this pace, you think? Yeah, and some of those are cheats because, like, for example, um, you know, I have books that are have been done for years and years, and so... I can sometimes I'm writing a book, a brand new book, and sometimes I am cleaning up something that I've actually been working on for a long time. So it's a little bit, little bit disoriented or a little bit, um, it skews the, the graph a little bit to say. But having said that, for me, if I'm typing, I write about a thousand words, takes me about 40 minutes. And if I'm voice dictating, I can do usually about 1200 words between 800 and 1200 words in about a half an hour. But you, so we'll just, we'll just say that it's easily, it's easy to do a thousand words in an hour. That would be very safe to say. So most people can find three hours in their day. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's harder to do that. But so to say I was going to write a 90,000 word, which is a big novel by a lot of indie standards, but about what, about an average Stephen King book, I think, um, or an, an average, traditionally published thriller or a lot of those books are supposed to be around 90,000. That's what the guideline used to be before the indie world broke everything and changed everything to these different lengths of books. But so 90,000 words, that's 3000 words a day. And it, that would take about three hours. So that's not like, um, it's not like I'm saying I work 15 hours a day to get these books written. No, I just, <laughs> if I can get three or four solid hours with relatively undistracted, you know, I can write a book a month. Wow. Especially if they're only like 70,000 words long, then you get a little extra time. And also a lot of the collaborators I work with, they have like these multi-tier um, editor and beta reader things. And so like I'll write a book for Jeff Cheney and send it off to him. And in four days, he'll have it back to me. And it's been through three beta readers and an editor. And then he's edited it. And he's like, here's some stuff you need to change. And so I finish it. I make the changes, which a lot of times aren't much because they will, they will change stuff. I'm, I'm not the, it's, I almost like it better if an editor just changes it because <laughs> yeah. they'll send it back to you. And, and I like, for example, Enemy of Man, I was my first book I had professionally edited and it's been edited like three times now by a professional. But the first time it, so I had written it and then I basically rewrote it so that, so that again, this will skew how long it took to write, but it took me 40 days to write it. Hmm. 
And and then I sent it off to a professional editor. I was very excited. It was my first time. They sent it back to me. And there was a correction or a comment on every single line of the book. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and, and, um, and it took me four months to deal with the edits. So it took me 40 days to write it and four months to go through the edits. And I since learned that, that that was a fairly new editor at the time. Yeah. And I think that she was trying too hard. It was like probably not every line needed to be changed in the entire book. <laughs> but as I have kind of a, a pleaser personality, so I was like, I literally went through and agonized over every single comment. And there were thousands and thousands of things that, that she thought I should change or consider or modify or improve. And I um, mean, it's probably a better book. But boy, it about killed me the first time. I was like, it's always going to be like this. But now a lot of times I'll get back stuff from an editor. And it'll, it'll take me like an afternoon to fix it. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it just hit me. I just realized when you were discussing that, how you how you write. So you, it doesn't sound like you're really planning these. You got the idea in your head and you're just running with it. It sounds like you're almost pensing it. I, I definitely started out that way. Now I do a little bit more outlining. Um Largely because, like, when I started collaborating with Richard Fox, he sends me, in, in our collaboration, we work out the basic story, and then he sends me the outline. And and Richard is very specific on what he wants because he has a very complex story universe that's done very well. And so it has to fit. I'm writing to satisfy his readers, and so it has to be like Richard would write it. Um and which is a great learning experience. I actually took away a lot, a lot from that collaboration. So he sends me the outline. So I have to write by an outline. I can't just chase things off into the weeds. Um, and so then, and then like if I'm writing for Jeff, um, you know, he has a very big fan base and they're very loyal and they, they're just fantastic, mm -hmm. but they want a certain product, a certain quality of product. And so I will outline to make sure I'm consistent. Oh, okay. With 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 the type of story, you know, they don't I don't they don't go to read a military space opera and I send them, you know, a, you know, a horror novel, you know, that which right. is where it could go if you just if you're just purely going by the seat of your pants. So I do both. What I a lot, of, a lot of times do is I will at least write out the story premise. I will do a partial outline. I'll start writing and then somewhere around halfway or three quarters to the book. I will outline the rest of it. Okay. So that's that's my most common way of doing it. It's kind of a half and half. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Well, what uh, what's coming up for you? Um, right now, we just, Jeff, Janie, and I just released a book called Blade of the Reaper. It's out now. It's the third book in the series. I'm writing Wings of the Reaper for Jeff. I'm writing one of my own uh, novels I've been working on on the side for a while. Called It's a, called Invasion Day right now. Um, I have a couple other collaborations I'm toying around with and, um, and I have a thriller that I, I have, and then I have two and a half books of a, or of a epic fantasy that I started writing in the nineties that I would like to eventually finish someday and get those out there. So, um, just all the stuff. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Well, where, where can people find you and follow you online? Uh, the, there's two, two good places. One's a little bit indirect. You can go to Keystroke Medium on Facebook, and that's it's a podcast that I'm in, a podcast slash YouTube show that that I I started with Josh Hayes, and I'm very active on that, and we have a lot of people there, so that's a fun place to go. Yeah, um, I, I'm sorry, I I totally meant to. I even have that underlined here on my notes, so I meant to go ahead and talk about that for a moment. Tell us about Keystroke. Okay, um, so Keystroke Medium, uh, I I was writing. I had published a couple of books and I was Twittering and I made some comments about being at work. And then Josh Hayes, who also worked at the police department at the time, he commented like, yeah, that's pretty boring training. And then I realized that he also liked to write. So we started talking about writing because, you know, finding an actual living and breathing writer that's like close to where you live that is writing the same type of stuff is pretty rare. Uh -huh. So we we got to know each other. We started doing a – a, our, we created our own writing group, which turned out to be just two people. And we would go, <laughs> we would go to Starbucks or we'd pick a random coffee shop and we would go and we'd write for a couple hours and talk about books. And if we went to like Barnes and Noble where they have a coffee shop, we would write for an hour, talk about some books, and then we'd go browse around and look at books and 
dream about, you know, making it big and all that. And then after a while, it, you know, we both had very busy lives. It was getting difficult. And I think Josh probably is the one who suggested it. He said, why don't we try just do like a hangout or a chat online or something? And so we did. I think we used Blab initially because the uh, smarter or the uh, self-publishing podcast were using Blab and we both watched them. So we did that. And so we would have our writing group or meeting and we said, well, we should just make this a show. We'll try to make it a podcast. And we were, we were very much had no idea what we were doing. And we started doing that. And after a while, after probably five or six, it might have been 10 episodes, we had our first guest. And that was Ralph Kern, who was a police officer in England. And then we went on down. We had we had Nick Cole and Jason Onspach. Um, we had Richard Fox. We had several people that, you know, we were amazed that they would come on the show. Eventually, we now we've had David Weber on two or three times. We've, we've had Peter F. Hamilton. Um, we mostly science fiction, but we've had some fantasy people. Uh, Brian Stavely, uh, uh, Nick, uh, Nick Sansbury Smith. We've been on several times. It's just a lot of people. I mean, it's, we literally have hundreds of people that have been on there now. So I'm not trying to be like a, an annoying name dropper, but we're just really. <laughs> it, it was just it was just really cool that that they would come on and talk to us. We couldn't believe it. Like we got, when we got Peter of Hamilton to come on, we literally were like, neither one of us are very nervous people um, because both being police officers, you have to be able to just talk to people. Yeah. And some, and so, but I felt like a little kid during some of those interviews and then they turned out to be super cool, super nice. And so we talk about writing and, and stories and whatever. We had several people that were watching the show volunteer to like keep show notes. Uh, Lauren, Lauren Moore, was the first one. And then Kayleen Williams and, and several other people have basically said, Hey, we want to be part of this. And we brought them into the company. We eventually got an LLC and, and made it official. Uh, but then, so now Lauren and Kayleen have their own show um, called the writer's journey on keystroke medium on Thursday nights, Josh and I, and sometimes uh, Steve Boyer or uh, Ralph or <clears throat> Devin Ford or some of those guys will do uh, Monday nights um, well, we do a show too, and and they're both a little bit different, but they they both bring some pretty good content. And we tell stories and make stupid jokes. And um, Lauren and Kayleen are much more organized. They probably, in my opinion, probably actually produce a better product if you're trying to learn how to do stuff. <laughs> we, we go off in the weeds and make bad jokes a lot. So, <laughs> well, that sounds amazing. I I can't believe I haven't come across that yet. So I'm gonna have to definitely all add that to my. Uh, yeah. To my podcast shows here. You can go, you can go to keystrokemeeting.com as our website. Um, or you can just find us on, on either YouTube or on, uh, Facebook's the easiest place. Cause then you can like join in the shenanigans and all the chats. So it'd be great. Oh, fantastic. All right. All right. So we have keystroke medium and then where's the other place to find you? Uh, the main place I, I do keep a website. It's scottmoonwriter.com. And it's, you know, the front, the landing page is basically just like whatever is my most current book <clears throat> and a chance to sign up for my newsletter. If you sign up for my newsletter, you get some free books, but you also get access to some audio books I had made that are too short to be sold on ACX, but just right for a, like a podcast type thing. Um, but I'm not really the tech guy in my group. So the, when I call the podcast, that's really just kind of a something you can listen to on the internet. It's not really super fancy, but, but you can get that and it's, it's recorded by a professional narrator. So that's my main page, but then I have, you know, all my other books are on there. You can go to Amazon and, and look at them if you want. All right. Fantastic. Well, I, I'm excited. I, I, this has been fantastic. And yeah, I, I, hopefully after you retire and you decide you want to hit some shows, hopefully we can run into each other at one of them and, and uh, that'd be really, really great. Of course, if I can make it to Vegas, that would be a good way to. That's a good one. It's you know it's cheap. <laughs> it's not too expensive to get to Vegas, and the, and uh, twenty bucks is is an inexpensive conference. So that'll always yeah. be one I go to probably. But the, but I want to go to some cons and stuff too. I want to get all over. I like to travel. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. Hey, on ironically, you are my second interview recently of somebody who's been to the twenty books. So I'm like, oh gosh, I got to get there sometime. Yeah, we had a meetup, a like Keystroke Media meetup last year. We had like 60 people come, and we bought some food and hung out, and it was cool. Yeah, fantastic. All right, well, hey, Scott, I really appreciate you coming on, and even though I know you've got, uh, I think, all of your books are on uh, Audible or whatever, I appreciate that uh, you're going to read for us today, 
and uh, I really look forward to uh, talking to you again sometime. Yeah, good. good. I'm, I'm looking forward to it too. I mean, I appreciate you having me on. It's, you've been a very gracious host and super patient with my dumb schedule, so I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, it the pleasure is all mine, bud. Well, ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's time for me to get out of the way and hand the floor over to our guest, Scott Moon, with Book 3 from the Chronicles of Ken Rowland. This is The Weapons of Earth. All right, thank you very much. So we'll start right here with Weapons of Earth. This is Chapter 1, chapter title, God's Family and Sergeants. Aftermath. Ken didn't know how other troopers felt when the final explosion echoed across the battlefield when injured men and women cried a dissonant counterpoint melody to celebrations of survivors drunk on life, but he had eyes and ears. He saw soldiers clutching mortal wounds, wailing in the wordless language of vows pushed through clenched teeth. Veterans and rookies begged for mercy, calling to friends who died long ago on other planets during other campaigns. They beseeched gods and family and sergeants. He could see Laura sitting on a rock and had been trying to reach her for half an hour. She looked tired but not wounded, not seriously. Everyone was slashed and shot and burned in this place. Beyond her, like the backdrop to a tasteless recruiting poster, were new Earth Fleet ships. The sleek machines dominated tactical positions blocking the pass to Long Canyon, more recently known as the Battle of the Bleeding Grounds. Ken paused, then resumed his slow forward progress. Mother came to cry from an impossible distance, or it was very close. God help me. Ken searched for the second voice, a woman facing oblivion with a damaged larynx, but never found her. Stop making that noise. Time passed. He walked without blinking as dust stretched across the sky. A face coughed blood. The weight of his fallen comrades pinned him to the ground, forcing him to stare between their arms and legs into the blinding noonday sun. He got me, Kevin. Got me good. Kneeling, pushing the bodies aside, Ken poured a trickle of water from his drinking tube into the trooper's mouth, watching his lips tremble as the man's head rose toward the source of the mercy. He was from Earth Garden, designated Earth 6 in official records. Distinct for their walnut-colored skin and lavender irises, they were uncommon in the fleet during Ken's days. Who are you? the injured garden man asked. Confusion bloomed in his eyes. Clarity followed. Tears filled cracks and wrinkles. I'm not Kevin, Ken said. The man shook his head in denial as he spoke, skin pale from blood loss, smoke drifting from the inside of his armor. I know he made it home. Ken nodded, placing his hand on the dying trooper's shoulder. He paused, then stood and faced the carnage. Sunlight cut through the gloom. A stoic non-com broadcast rally point coordinates and big band music over loudspeakers. Troopers arched signal flares into the sky as they cheered. Men and women with venial wounds congratulated fellow survivors, slamming together in powered armored hugs and fist bumps that thundered like the titans of mythology. Ken saw them, he heard them, but he didn't know their hearts or minds. It was as though he watched the scene through time and space. The red plains of Hell's Breach had been lonelier, but not by much. Dead men and women said nothing. Maybe they looked as though they were passing judgment on the living. Perhaps the corpses were resentful. Ken picked his way across the bleeding grounds, stepping over bodies without touching them. Many of the faces had turned into the dirt to avoid the mind-bending horror of the battle's climax as they died. He had stared into the eyes of fallen soldiers before, but a hellish vacancy dominated the victims of the wormhole nexus as though they had never lived. Fifty meters away, a trooper fired a tight pattern of rounds into the back of a reaper as it squatted on a corpse and tugged flesh from the face of a winger. Bullets spattered through the monster's body. Before the last projectile struck, the trooper was kneeling to strip gear from a fallen comrade that had nothing to do with the reaper slain. The terrible efficiency of the routine resonated through Kin's soul. That one will survive the next battle, he thought. Standard operating procedures directed field commanders to secure battlefields for the Resource and Salvage Division under the command of the Quartermaster General. The FSPAA unit, or FSPA, cost more than the average civilian earned in a lifetime. A magazine of uranium-depleted bullets would fund a vacation to many of the better casino platforms around Earth-6, not for the uranium, but for the technology that made them so small and deadly. Battlefield cleanup was big business. Every molecule of weaponry belonged to the fleet. On harsher planets, 
reclamation tanker sponged up blood and processed the corpses for water. Ken collapsed the Ma's helmet into the shoulder assembly of his skin armor, S-K-I-N, and rubbed sweat from his eyes. The stink of chemicals floated on the wind and smoke. He understood that when the odor of technology faded, there would be organic smells. Odors lingered the longest. He couldn't decide which was worse, the smell of burnt flesh and bone or ravaged armor and weapon systems. One was alive, the other was mechanical. On this battlefield, there was something assaulting his olfactory senses he didn't understand. If the sense of smell could also be haunting awareness of atmospheric pressure, then he would know it now. Return to base and recharge, soldier, the skin computer said. I'll get right on that. Crashdown's gravity had pushed down with insulting persistence as the armor lost power. Ken pried his arms and legs free of the unit, then dropped the torso shell. He looked at the Maz gear and shook his head. There were so many pieces missing that he wondered why he hadn't ditched the wreck hours ago. He blinked against the breeze and thought of Earth-8, a cursed planet that enjoyed 300 years of independence from the homeworld before starting a war to break a trade embargo. Ken's companions had pounded fists together as they prepared for the planetary assault. He hadn't sung the body songs or boasted with his troops because he'd been listening to people he wouldn't see on the next mission, memorizing the tone and melody of their voices, the quirks of individual expressions, and bidding them farewell. Each trooper understood the odds of survival. Each sergeant knew he would get half his unit killed if he was both lucky and good. The bad sergeants, well, they got fragged on this type of drop. Men and women, boys and girls, whatever. Ken's head hurt and he felt vaporous and out of place. Planetary defenses cut the first wave to pieces. Ken, the greenest non-com in the vanguard, kept his squad alive and took command of two other squads separated from their platoons. That was when he noticed the difference between the sound of mortal and venial wounds. Dying soldiers cried without tears or cursed. You've got a hole through your bicep. Dog Rolston was seven feet tall. In his gear, he looked like a long-limbed ogre with a head too big for his body. He took hold of Ken's arm and glared at the strike. Your sub-armor has constricted it. You'll need to have it examined. Ken nodded. A short, thick man in battered F-spa armor burst forward, smoke rising from his weapons, flecks of napalm glowing on the metal and ceramic plates of his armor. That fucking rocked. I was full auto with both guns when we came over that last hill, Greg Teamster said. He was the same size as Dog in terms of overall mass, but two feet shorter. Ken glanced at the stocky trooper. Good for you, dwarf. Go to hell, Roland, the man said. Ken resisted the urge to use the nickname again. That's sir to you. Battered inside of his Espa armor, as every member of the planetary assault force was, Dwarf hadn't been cut by a bullet or a shrapnel. It was easy to be cocky when you had killed without taking a scratch. The giant and the dwarf were an odd pair. Of late, here on Crashdown, with the battle of the bleeding grounds behind him and memories haunting his steps, Ken suffered a powerful dream of begging the two men for water on a desolate planet that could only be the Reaper homeworld. Flashbacks of storming Hellsbridge caused him to sweat. He compared the troopers. Dwarf didn't impress him. Dog Rolston had ignored celebration and shit-talking, ignored the awkward silence between Ken and Dwarf. He magnetically secured his weapons to his armor and knelt to strip unusable parts and ammunition from dead friends. Ken stared at the violation but did nothing. He had looked the other way when Dog, Dwarf, and several others returned to a smoldering enemy bunker to scavenge for supplies and trophies as a second wave of planetary assault troopers streaked down toward the surface, unopposed. We'll all get the same combat rhythm, an average-sized trooper said. Ken studied the private, unable to remember his name. Call me Jojo. You're not going to resupply in the field like the others? I'm more of an information guy. His smile was more comforting than a slit throat and nearly as wide. I'll have a look around. If that one isn't counterintelligence division, he will be. The weight of crash-down gravity and the peculiar post-battle breeze pulled Ken back to the present with surreal force, but not completely. He watched the memory of the man wander away, unnoticed by other troopers, and realized Jojo was a shadow in a persistent half-nightmare that had plagued him for years. Dog, Dwarf, Jojo, and Hell's Breach. Of the nightmares he retained after Earth-8, this was the least violent. It was one of the few post-traumatic stress flashbacks born of imagination. It was a bad memory that didn't feel like the past. Earth-8, for all the bloodshed, had been a walk in the park compared to Hell's Breach, or even Hector's Mountain, on a planet named New Mediterranean. After the battle for Hector's Mountain, veterans spread word of its beauty throughout the galaxy and called the planet by the popular name for the Savage Campaign. Ken met Orlon for the first time during this mission. 
the large-scale hostage rescue operation became a true hero story in the history books. It would have been easy with air support and artillery barrage to soften bunkers and machine gun nests. For all the fighting, the thing he remembered about Hector's Mountain was a barroom brawl afterward, and only because of the pissing match between Orlon and Dog. Until that moment, Ken thought he knew who was the biggest, meanest bastard in the fleet. No one cared about the fight except for Dog's friends, who argued about the winner with anyone willing or semi-willing to listen. Orlon didn't have friends, so it was always a one-sided discussion. Few troopers had time to keep score. Most just wanted to get laid before leaving the system. The entire division took a week of liberty in Kathy's town as Hector's Mountain smoked in the background, rivers turning red, forest fires clouding the atmosphere. Ken hadn't thought of his early career since Droon came to crash down. Names and faces paraded through his memory, some good, others tragic, but all of them comforting compared to where he stood now. The destruction and carnage left in the wake of the Battle of the Bleeding Grounds couldn't be described. Ken had seen cities leveled, planets sterilized, and space docks torn to shreds by heavy weapons. He witnessed the best and the worst of the men during the hours following victory, and when he said men, he meant men and women. F-SPA armor made female violence look just like male violence. Sex didn't matter, race didn't matter, rank didn't matter. Killing was killing and death was permanent. He'd learned what a person would do to stay alive during a retreat. And of course, he'd seen all the nightmares of Hell's Breach. Fighting on the bleeding grounds caused a different damage. Reality became unsettled. The emperor of the Ma's race was Ulusalaj Underbach, first of his name. Ken remembered General Nander fondly by comparison. In death, he was more real than Underbach. Rebecca couldn't be found. He had the ungenerous suspicion she was avoiding him. So now he sat next to Laura Keene and shared his theory concerning the emperor's name and studied the profile of her face as she looked toward the ships on the edge of the battlefield. They were Earth fleet vessels, pristine and new. A trace amount of space luster grime smeared the exterior. The engines were unlike any he'd seen, huge, dark, and dormant. His first impression, strange as it seemed, was not of thrust, but of machines that devoured energy and changed it. Volusialage Anderbach, Ken said. His parents must have wanted bullies to pound his face. Is that what those fancy Earth fleet warships are, the bullies? Laura asked. Ander can't stand against them, Ken said, distracted. There were other forces on the bleeding grounds of Crashdown. From his position on the foothills, he observed the tattered remnants of the Roar Ray and sensed Clavender was among them, although he couldn't see her. Across the valley from Winger's survivors, Westwood's own entrenched the first Earthfleet camp, almost as though the Admiral wasn't sure what kind of welcome to provide the newcomers. The Emperor stood on a hill, with chrome-plated bodyguards surrounding him as he stared at the exotic new warships of Earth. There had been no rest or liberty for his people. They had been drawn into ranks and re-equipped the moment the Battle of the Bleeding Grounds ended. What disturbed Ken were the Ma's units he didn't recognize, non-camouflage skins and solid colors and gleaming metal. Chrome was not a feature he had seen on a Ma's soldier before Underbar. Look at him, Laura said. How many rulers in history went into exile and came back to absolute loyalty? Absolute might be a rather strong term, Ken said as he surveyed the motionless armies. Can Anderbach be the Ma's emperor? 10,000 years is a long time. The only reason he didn't laugh at the idea was that he believed Clavender was nearly immortal. The Ma's were human, more or less. He struggled with the concept of a deathless Ma's emperor. As a result, he could not trust the man. When Clavender opened the way to the bleeding grounds, it materialized as an overlay of Long Canyon. Prior to the final battle, Ken spent weeks fleeing from Drew across the uneven terrain. He knew this area well. Images of his bullets striking Corporal Rafe boomed through his memory unbidden. He recalled Rickson's fear and Clavender's tears. He had allowed Clingers to devour his friend Bear not a half-day's march from here. Good job, Ken. You're a regular hero. Your friends don't need enemies. Before the battle, there had been towering spires, gullies, and sandbars, twisting scrub thickets that appeared tame from a distance, drawing unwary travelers into a deadly maze. Now the place looked like red glass with a few crater-pocked hills and ridges like busted scabs. Ken was tired of being hunted, tired of being an outlaw, tired of being a general about to be betrayed or a traitor about to be hanged. Ma's soldiers had followed him and obeyed his order. Now they watched him, ignored his plight, and refused to share information. Emperor Felucialaj Anderbach commanded the largest hill in Long Canyon, the position Ken had scouted and judged the best location to deal with the remaining threats. There were still reapers, wingers, and earth fleet facing the Maws. Nasty local creatures had been awakened by the noise of the battle. You're welcome, Ander. Don't mention it. I saved your army. No need to thank me. 
Admiral Westwood remained in a weak tactical position with the newly arrived vessels, more of a political decision than a strategic one. The winged people of the Royal Ray centered themselves around Clavender in the middle of the now absent wormhole nexus. Ken could hear them singing and see the slow rhythmic dance of their wings. Images of the final battle punched memories free of the mental cages he used to remain sane. He had thought the Royal Ray warriors would never stop coming from the skies. Every wave had seemed more glorious than the last. Had they not been fighting Ma's war machines, Earth fleet dropships, Reapers in bloodlust, and the Slom, they would have carried the day. We began the fight united against the Slom, then the ancient rivalries and hatred exploded in blood and fire. What did I do wrong? Laura brushed past him, drawing him from his dark reverie with physical contact that was both casual and intimate. She moved so close that her hair dragged over his arm, and she breathed on his neck for the briefest moment. Then she stepped away to adjust the collar of her shirt with one finger. Do they have factions within factions, Laura asked. A dry breeze shifted the thick hair as she waited for him to meet her gaze. Ken considered the duplicity of the Ma's people. There had been a push to block his ascension to command. Of course, why not? He was an outsider and a notorious traitor. His initial success among them stood as a testament to General Nander's influence. But things changed once Emperor Lushalaj Anderbach, their so-called savior and messiah, returned. Nander couldn't have seen that coming. No one had really believed a man could live for 10,000 years. They are men and women like anyone else, sort of. I can't say I understand them. It's hard to believe they have a perfect devotion to their leader. Ken took a sip from his water container. I need to talk to Clavender. I don't think this new fleet came through the wormhole. Is that possible? Laura asked. Ken shook his head and tried to remember everything about the scene. These ships were not here before Clavender closed the bleeding grounds. Laura pushed back her hair and sat up straighter, making mo the most of her figure. She gazed across the landscape, dark and grand, and looked beautiful in the wind. Ken wished Rebecca had never returned because now he was torn and confused. He couldn't imagine that Laura didn't feel slighted. She wouldn't be consoled now that Rebecca was avoiding him. If he turned to her for comfort, would she be angry at being his second choice? He laughed. Laura would make him pay, and he'd deserve it. He looked across the hills and the plains on the floor of Long Canyon, trying to spot Rebecca or Clavender, and found neither. He knew where Clavender was, but couldn't see through the ritual dancing and display of wings. Some of the wings remained battle black, which wasn't a good sign. Troopers deployed from the new Earthfleet ships. A chill went up Ken's spine. Their S-Spy units were something to behold, smooth lines and no extra bulk or weight. Laura laughed. You should see your expression. Ken forced a laugh. I need gear, and those units look state-of-the-art. And that was Scott Moon reading an incredibly gritty chapter from his latest book of the Chronicles of Ken Rowland series. This was book three, Weapons of Earth. Oh my gosh. You know, when he was first reading it, I was already into it, but then getting to listen to it over and over again for this editing process was amazing. Hey, don't forget to click on the links so you can follow Scott, as well as all of our sponsors and friends. Lots of great stuff out there. Don't forget to also hit that subscribe button so that way next week you don't miss out when we come back with a new author, a new book, and a new sample chapter. Thank you so much for tuning in. Happy late Father's Day again and take care.